Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Matthew Melmed, Executive Director of Zero to Three. Since 1977, Zero to Three has focused on promoting the health and development of infant and toddlers with an emphasis on informing, training, and supporting early childhood professionals, policymakers, and parents. Zero to Three transforms research and knowledge into practical tools to develop a support system for infant and toddlers to reach their full potential, and Matthew has agreed to share some of his experiences with us. I'd like to thank you, Matthew, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure. So zero to three is an amazing time in the, in, in the development of, of any human being. Talk about the idea behind an organization called Zero to Three. Well, it, it really goes back almost uh, 40 years. There was an emerging understanding of the science of early childhood development. And you had a number of pioneers who were getting together informally to talk with each other, to learn from each other. They came from different disciplines, different research backgrounds. You had people uh, such as T. Barry Brazelton, who was certainly well known as America's pediatrician, and others who would not be household names, but within their specific disciplines, whether it was looking at sensory integration, whether it was looking at infant mental health, they were learning. And they came together almost like the blind men and the women with the elephant, saying, can we look and put a whole picture together? Uh, and they did. They didn't intend to form an organization. They really came together to just learn. But they realized in time that they were onto something, and they started to meet on a regular basis. They decided to hire a, uh, a director. Um, I'm only the second executive director in the organization's 35-year history, but the, uh, they hired a director, and the organization in its uh, 0-3, 1.0 model uh, in its first um, uh, 15 or, or so years, really was focusing on trying to understand the emerging science. It was not playing a very significant role in terms of taking that knowledge and getting it out more broadly to uh, a whole range of audiences. It was really focused much more on people that I would characterize as having a graduate degree uh, level understanding of early childhood development. What's really interesting is that you have these famous stories of the garage where HP was founded, but there are equally compelling stories of the coffee table around which people drank coffee and talked about early childhood development. And from these, this very kind of informal uh, gathering um, emerge ideas, uh, studies, um, uh, small initiatives, small projects, and over the years they, they, they get built into an organization. No question. In, in this particular instance, it happened uh, in a room over a dark drugstore in Rockville, Maryland, okay. uh, where people came together. Uh, they had a we'll little bit of money. put the brass plaque. <laughs> right. here, here is the it's, I don't think the dark drugstore is still there, but, uh, <laughs> no. but um, they, they were able to get a little bit of money from the National Institute of Mental Health mm -hmm. to just convene meetings, and people really came and they learned. And I think out of that, that sort of organic coming together, a whole field of knowledge and practice has grown really over the last 35 years. So you got a tiny bit of, uh, of funding from, from a government entity that is using sort of your tax dollars at work to, mm -hmm. to, to bring people together. Now very often these kinds of situations do not result in the formulation of, uh, of an organization. Academics are, uh, can famously have very, very strong opinions and have uh, can famously uh, not come together. Mm -hmm. What was the difference in this particular case, do you feel? I, I think that there was a real passion uh, for understanding human development and to really uh, take that knowledge and to try to share it more broadly. Interestingly, though, that in the uh, two years preceding my recruitment, um, the organization nearly went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it, it was much more of a, uh, a group of academics who were not so much focusing on the organization mm -hmm. as they were on the subject matter. And they lost sight of that, and the organization really ran into some serious uh, financial difficulties. The, the budget at that point was about $2.5 million, and they were losing a significant amount of money. And then they decided to go out and, uh, and to do a search, and... Um, they found someone who 
interestingly enough, was not an MD, a PhD, an OTR, RN, DSW. And when they first came to recruit me, I didn't know what a dyad was. And I said, <laughs> you know, you guys don't speak English. Um, but what was really powerful for me uh, was learning about the incredible growth that was going on in the first three years of life. What that represented into laying the foundation for who we become as adults and the fact that it wasn't widely known. It wasn't really out there in the public in the way that it needed to be. Well, you're, you're pointing out something really important. Great work, great ideas need to be married to great communication of those ideas, a way to triangulate with people who are not insiders in the field. That needs to be married to a great operational sensibility, and that needs to be married with a strong financial sensibility. Um, until you have those different uh, pieces, you really can't get those ideas to market. Mm -hmm. Is it any different than developing an Apple product? Oh, not at all. But I, I think that the, the challenge that lives within the nonprofit sector, and I, I feel that uh, Zero Three has had tremendous success in terms of sparking a national uh, uh, understanding about the importance of the early years. But even with that, the ability to really get out there and be able to market um, and, and have the information products that we produce out there uh, in the broader marketplace where parents go and even where professionals who work with parents right. go is, is a challenge. Um, too often in the nonprofit world, uh, there's not a much emphasis on that as there is on the sort of creation of the, of the, the resources and the information. And so when I came, I was very committed and focused on trying to make sure we could create those information products and found ways of trying to create partnerships with um, other nonprofits and for-profit companies that would get the messages out um, in the way that would be helpful. Deconstruct for, uh, for, for a moment how the organization works and, and the range of programs that, that you, you have. Sure, we, uh, the organization is, is actually a very complex um, organization. We um, have um, a major series of programs supporting professionals. I would say probably about 70% of what we do is really aimed at supporting uh, professionals or systems of mm -hmm. care, different systems of care, which I can explain. And roughly uh, the, the, the latter part is really focused in on public policy and really trying to take the science of early childhood and try to apply it in a way that public policy reflects um, what we can be doing to help support healthy development for babies and toddlers, particularly at-risk babies and toddlers. And at this definition of public policy, it really is connecting the dot between what the, uh, the government and communities do and what the child actually experiences. I mean, yes, no question. I think that a lot of people have a uh, conceptual challenge mm -hmm. making the link between babies and public policy. Right. Um, but if you look at what happens in the United States and you compare the United States to virtually every Western industrialized country in the world, our policies are far less supportive of promoting healthy development for babies and toddlers. So for example, we're the only Western industrialized country in the world that doesn't have a paid family leave policy. Everybody else has them. Uh, most other countries have a series of supports where parents can learn and get help from uh, nurses or other professionals about the early years. Babies don't come with a, a manual. Right. And for first-time parents, that can be a very, very frightening uh, experience, particularly if you're dealing with uh, challenged parents, young parents. 48% of babies and toddlers in the United States, and there are 12 million uh, babies and toddlers at any given time, 48% almost six million, are living uh, at a low income or below the poverty line. And that in itself brings tremendous stresses and tremendous challenges that we need to be looking at. And so you, you were talking about uh, public policy um, and, and your efforts there. Um, why don't you continue in terms of, uh, uh, of your programs and how your organization works? Sure. We've, uh, w Zero to Three was um, 
instrumental in helping Congress about 17 years ago recognize that uh, Head Start mm -hmm. for a lot of poor kids at age four was too late. The science was very clear that we needed to be reaching pregnant women and babies and toddlers. And so we helped to advocate for and promote the creation of Early Head Start, which um, has tremendous research behind it now, randomized controlled trials showing its efficacy. And Early Head Start, unfortunately, still only reached 4% of the estimated eligible pregnant women and infants and toddlers in this country. From a professional development perspective, we competed and became the Early Head Start National Resource Center. So we are doing that uh, with a contract with the Office of Head Start. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of work with the military, interestingly. Um, we were very concerned after 9-11 when we started to see the ramping up of, uh, of soldiers going overseas that uh, they would, their babies and toddlers would experience particular stresses due to separation or trauma or loss. Perhaps mom or dad doesn't come back or doesn't come back the same way. And so we, with with $25,000 in private funding, we're able to begin a whole training initiative, developing resources for professionals who work and support military families as well as military families themselves, created children's board books that parents could read to their children, a whole range of materials, and did a lot of training that eventually morphed into the Department of Defense coming to us and saying, we need this and we want this to go international and are working with the Department of Defense to make that happen. So you're developing foundational research, you're sharing that research with others, you convert that research into products mm -hmm. that you can put in the hands of parents and uh, caregivers and, and others who are counseling parents. Um, you have developed a considerable font of intellectual property mm -hmm. as a result? Yes, I mean, we have a whole range of materials that we develop, primarily aimed again at professionals. Those could be pediatricians, child care providers, early interventionists, people working in the child welfare system. Um, and we tailor it to the needs of those particular professionals. Most babies are in child care uh, mm -hmm. at some point in their lives. And a lot of providers really don't really understand early childhood development. They don't know how to partner with a parent. We develop a whole range of materials for that. We also have a lot of materials that are aimed directly at parents. Um, and because of the, the marketing uh, challenge I discussed earlier, uh, we reach parents primarily through the web or we create partnerships. Uh, we, for example, for many years created a partnership with Johnson & Johnson where we developed a range of materials that they were able then to bring to parents directly through their much larger marketing mechanisms. And the the, w the work that we've done for parents, interestingly, has grown so significantly that just this past year, we were approached by a, a for-profit company in China who asked us to help design a parenting education program for them and a sort of parent experience where parents can come with their babies and toddlers and learn about their children's development. So we just uh, signed that, uh, that deal this summer and we're um, doing that as a first foray into uh, a broader international work. And that diversifies your revenue stream as well. No question. I think that the, like any nonprofit, we w were traditionally dependent upon either public funding or private funding. Um, but the more traditional sources, we recognized as we're going forward that with public funding becoming that much more challenged, and and if you want to do public policy work, you can't use public funding for that. Right. That certainly obviously needs to be privately funded as well, that we needed to diversify our funding base. And so we are, we are really looking at exploring how can we take this tremendous amount of intellectual property that we have and be able to repurpose it. it from a mission perspective, we want everybody to have it right. for free. From a organizational perspective, we need to develop some revenue streams. And so we're really looking to understand what we can give away for free and what may actually have a value that a market value that's meeting a need that um, professionals or even parents might pay for. Talk about where you're going in the next uh, several years. Is your basic challenge one of scale? 
one of scope? Um, are, there, are there shifts in, in governance that are going to be uh, pursued? Yes, and in fact, we're, we're right in the midst of a strategic planning process at this point in time. Um, I would characterize the last 17 years of, as being 0 to 3, 2.0, and now we're trying to envision 0 to 3, 3.0, and really trying to understand where we need to go. And as part of that, we, we've come to recognize that we need, as we discussed, to diversify the revenue base, but we also need to have a lot, be a lot better at communication, mm -hmm. at um, strategic communications as it relates to policy, reaching out to parents in different ways. Um, we have lots of information. Right. The challenge is, is how do you package it for whom and get it out in the ways that people can use that? Without it becoming right. overwhelming. Yes, and I think that uh, we've had people look at our website, for example, and they say uh, there have been reviews of websites for parents and um, about half of the people coming to our website are parents. And uh, there was a review in the New York Times a few years ago that said we were the sort of mega wheat brand compared to the <laughs> sugar frosted flakes. But a lot of people like sugar frosted flakes. And so we have to get a lot better at trying to figure out how do you take some of that, that wheat and really get that out there in a way that people you know, can use that. And I think that's a challenge. From a governance perspective, um, we're looking at beginning to diversify our board. Our board traditionally for many years has really been made up of leading academics and researchers and clinicians. And we recognize that we need to have more of a balance and more diversity there that reflect the traditional skills that you would want to see in a nonprofit organization. So these are all um, challenges that we have to uh, embrace. And we're looking at trying now to really understand what type of structure, what type of skill sets that we don't have that we need both on the board and on the staff to help move us into this new direction. And in a sense, you are adopting more of an identity of not only a research nonprofit, but an educational nonprofit. An educational nonprofit that needs to market itself, needs to communicate its values, needs to think about market segmentation, as you say. There are some people who love the, um, the very sophisticated uh, presentation of, of um, of information and the Frosted Flakes version mm -hmm. of information. The better we are at being able to communicate and market, the better we actually are at achieving our mission. It's not just a question of raising revenue, it's a question right. of, of achieving mission. So I think of one uh, particularly important uh, issue that we're grappling with that I see if we had more capacity to do outreach to the audiences we need to outreach to, we can make a dramatic difference in terms of what goes on with babies in the United States. And that, that is an issue that deals with babies and toddlers who are abused or neglected. So every seven minutes in the United States, a baby is removed from their parent because of suspected abuse and neglect. And what tends to happen is that system, which is designed purely around the physical safety of the child um, is a developmental disaster right. for babies. They get put with uh, foster parents and they're bounced from home to home to home. They don't get the services that they need. If we want to reduce that, that pipeline into the system, we can do it at the zero to three age range given that babies are the biggest proportion of kids in foster care. So we've had a project that we've been doing for the last uh, seven years aimed at working with judges at the local level who are involved in these kinds of cases to play a leadership role in a community and literally transform everyone who touches that baby, all the lawyers, and, and there are loads of lawyers, uh, the child welfare agency, all the social right. service agencies, everybody who touches them to understand what is best for that baby and how to make the best choices from a developmental perspective. And it's starting to have some really significant impacts. But the challenge is you have a model, uh, you've designed it, but now you have to get it out there in a much broader way. Well, you're and absolutely, so that's the question. and your point about communication is, is so spot on because no matter how great your idea is, if you're shouting it into a closed closet and, and that's it, and nobody gets to experience it, it doesn't matter. Um, I've been able, I've been fortunate enough in the 17 years I've been at Zero to Three to see 
a significant shift in public awareness and understanding about the importance of the early years. When I first came and I would go around the country and I would talk to people about babies, I would get really skeptical looks. It would be like, really? Um, and then really through uh, the work with some folks, Rob Reiner in Hollywood and Hillary Clinton when she was the first lady, we were able to take a piece of the science, the neuroscience, and put that out in a way that it captured the public attention. And now when I go around and meet with people, they go, oh yeah, the early years really are important. It has something to do with the brain, right? <laughs> and that's fine because it then creates at least the opportunity for the discussion that's not just about the brain, but let's start there. And the science is, is, is really emerging. We, the whole uh, field of epigenetics right. is now looking at gene, gene expression and the nature and the importance of early experiences and early relationships. These are, I believe, really powerful uh, pieces of information that we as adults need to learn and act on. And I truly believe that if we can get our parents, our professionals, our policymakers moving, uh, even our philanthropists moving in this direction and making more investments here that I think that the, the seeds for a lot of the social challenges that we face later on in life with regards to special education and criminal justice um, and so forth will be ameliorated because the research is really clear that if you have a strong foundation, it's like building a house if you have a strong foundation, that house will be solid. But if you start with a really weak one, you're going to be doing a lot of repairs over many, many years to try to get it to where it should have been in the first place. And the same analogy holds to human development. So have you made the transition from being a study to a program to products to now a movement? I, I was anticipating and hoping that you'd say movement. And I think, yes, I do, I do think it's a movement. Um, and I think it's been, it's been um, uh, picked up, not obviously by zero to three, but other organizations. When, when I first came, we were the only kid in the sandbox. Now the sandbox has gotten pretty crowded. Um, and that's good. That shows that we've actually been successful. It also presents a challenge because we have to figure out, well, if there's a lot more people in this space, what's our unique niche? Part of, uh, part of the, the dialogue that we are having at Zero Three at this point in time is if we want to move to Zero Three Three Point Zero, how do we do that? How do we get the resources? How do we get the focus and the attention so that we are able in our next iteration to do what we did when we were 1.0 and 2.0? Well, Matthew Melman, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us, for the, the great work of Zero to Three, and thank you so much for your insights. It's my pleasure, Mark. It really was.